Good evening, good evening, YouTube. She got J. Crew to you coming at you with yet another video here on this lovely evening of January 16, 2022. Sitting here watching uh, the Kansas City Chiefs blow out uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, probably Ben Roethlisberger's last game playing in the NFL. My score is 42 21. It might be another score, but I'm not here to talk about that. Here to make a video that's a bit overdue. And I know a lot of y'all were probably, you know, wondering where this phrase has been. How about them dogs? <laughs> I know a lot of y'all probably wondering that. It's like, man, how come you haven't made a video on Georgia winning the national championship this past Monday on uh, January 10th? Well, there's a few reasons I haven't made a video yet. I'm, I'm the type of guy I like to take all uh, the, the post-secondary stuff in, in terms of as much as I can uh, in and then try to process it and put it to this video so I can make it well-organized, well-thought-out, and make it well worth your time as a viewer to watch my stuff. As, as I've said in past videos, I'm not the type of guy I don't like to rush videos out for the most part as soon as something happens. I like to take my time with information and put it out. And uh, that's what I try to do, you know, again with this video. I try to take my time with something and then put it out. Uh, as we all know, as I just said, the Georgia Bulldogs, uh, they beat the Alabama Crimson Tide uh, this past weekend. What was it, like 33-18 or something like that? Not even really fixate on the score. I'm still just amazed they, they came up with a way to beat the Crimson Tide. And uh, let me just say, I know, uh, you know, a lot of people probably don't want me to point certain things out in terms of why that happened, but I'm going to sort of talk about how I think that by winning the battle of attrition up front, UGA had, was going to be a favorite to win this game in certain ways. But keep in mind, I mean, I still didn't think they were going to do it because Georgia had faced Alabama four or five times over the past several years. They never could beat them. <laughs> they never could beat them. And I, I got tired of waiting on them. I said, man, you know, uh, it's never going to happen. We just probably need to wait to maybe maybe four or five more years. So Kirby Smart probably want to, you know, change up and go to a more up-tempo passing game and, and beat these guys, you know, and maybe he'll figure out a way to do it then. But but it, it was incredible seeing that. It was a, it was a huge amount of elation. As you probably heard over and over, if you follow Georgia football throughout the year, especially this past month, it had been 41 years, 1980, since they had they were able to say, hey, man, we had won a national championship. And now we're able to put that to bed and say, you know what, we can actually taste the national championship now. And we can stop crying about it. As I said before, with UGA, what used to come up a lot with them was that when they talked about a guy by the name of Herschel Walker, who's probably one of the best players ever to play in Georgia. You know, uh, it's really what people tend to go to, you know, when never talk of a national championship or a competitive time that most people really treasure with Georgia came up. I want to start talking about Herschel. But as I said before, I, I, I and, and I'm in a video I made uh, some weeks back, I got tired of talking about that because I'm like, I want to talk about some current stuff, you know, that we can sort of like reminisce over because Georgia's had a lot of great recruiting classes, man. They 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 tend to be a top five recruiting class for the past decade or so, but there was nothing that we saw that came from it in terms of a national championship until this past Monday night. Um, In terms of this Monday night, um, if you watch the game, one thing that jumped out, was that Georgia did not allow Alabama's running back, Brian Robinson Jr., to do too much of anything in this game as a running back. He had no memorable plays, really. Uh, nothing that you really could sort of write home about. So, you know, oh, man, that guy was awesome. He ran for 204 yards against Cincinnati, but, of course, Cincinnati is not Georgia. Georgia has more talent across the board. And we saw that, you know, UGA presented to be way more of a problem for Brian Robinson Jr., he just couldn't get anything going. That was number one. The number two thing, I think this was probably even more important, was that they had uh, Bryce Young running for his life throughout this game. Uh, Georgia's defense and their, and their uh, 
and their linebackers were getting, excuse me, uh, their defense line, especially their linebackers, were getting pressure on him. You know, they sacked him multiple times. They, they were constantly in his face, forced him to throw awkward passes, you know, inaccurate passes. I think Bryce Jones still maybe threw for over 300 yards, but a lot of it was during, you know, garbage time when, you know, it, it, they probably weren't going to catch up towards the end of the game. And so those were, that, that was the second reason why I thought Georgia was able to prevail in this game. In the first half, Georgia's running game really didn't get to going nowhere. But in the second half, I mean, when they got the ball back first, you can instantly see they got some going. Zeus White had some nice 8, 10-yard runs. And uh, I think, um, you know, James Cook, he had like a 76-yard run to kind of set up maybe a score uh, later on. So they got their running game going, and that was huge. And I thought it took pressure off of Stetson Bennett, the, you know, the much maligned and the much not thought about uh, Georgia quarterback. But I have to mention this. I know UGA fans who watch my videos, if you are, uh, you're probably going to get upset with my next comment. One thing I cannot ignore, but but I felt like it had an effect on this thing, uh, in this game, Alabama lost the battle of attrition. What does that mean for people who probably, uh, whose vocabulary ain't that well? Attrition means, hel you know, healthy people, people who are available to fight the fight for you. Going into the game, as I had pointed out in, in the uh, conference championship game like a month ago, uh, John, let me see, uh, John Mechie, uh, what was it, the, the junior or the third, the Alabama receiver, he had tore his uh, knee up in that conference championship game. That dude had like 96 catches for over 1,100 yards. Like during the regular season, he was he was excellent. He you know he was heavily productive as a number two receiver. He blew his knee out, even though Alabama prevailed in that game. So they did not have him at their disposal. Also, one of their top cornerbacks, Josh Joe, he wasn't available. And I don't know why he wasn't available. I probably should have looked it up before I did this video. I don't know why Josh Joe was not available for this game. He's a he one of their better cornerbacks. He wasn't available. And as we all unfortunately uh, saw. Uh, probably the top receiver in the country, Jamison Williams, the number one receiver for Alabama. Uh, right before halftime, uh, Bryce Young threw a, 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 a pass across the middle. It was a little bit behind Jamison, and that would become, uh, you know, what led up to the to, to uh, the unfortunate circumstance that we saw. When Bryce Young threw this pass to Jamison across the middle, it would have been like, a, what, a 30 or 40-yard gain or whatever it was. And Jameson had to adjust to catch the ball. He had to slow down and could turn out, turn his body all the way around. When he caught it, he had to turn his body like halfway back around to try to regain his balance. But when he was turning his body back around, trying to regain his balance, there was a UGA defender coming at him. So Jameson tried to stop and make a move. And it was almost like he didn't know what to do, but his, he planted his left foot in the ground and his, his, his leg just collapsed. It was very, very hard to watch. As a UGA fan, I could truthfully say that was very, very sad to see that occur. I mean, this guy, he's going to be one of the top prospects in the draft. I don't know how much, if any, he's going to drop in the draft because of this, but that's going to affect his draft stock. I mean, you blow out a knee, who knows if he's ever going to regain his speed. So it, it, that was very, very unfortunate. When you lose guys like that, obviously as the game went on the second half, it's going to help George out because – Alabama had played like freshman receivers. I think number 84 for Alabama. I think he got one of them, uh, them African names. I can't remember his name. Uh, I think uh, Bryce Young tried to throw a pass out to the right towards to the right-hand side of the field that was going to be in the red zone, but he dropped it. I mean, he was covered by the UJ defender. I think, well, I think Darion Kendrick maybe was covering him, uh, but he dropped the pass. And so uh, – and, I mean, and, and, but he should have caught that. Uh, and, and, and on a normal circumstance, that was most Alabama receivers. If that was Jamison Williams or John Mitch, they would have caught that. And so he dropped it. So that played into it. So just have just not having them three guys alone to finish that game, that was devastating to me to Alabama. So it was kind of set up for George to at least have a better chance of competing because they, they won their battle of attrition going to this game. Keep in mind, Georgia had lost their, their star receiver, George Pickens, in the spring to an ACL. But George Pickens had a long catch in the conference championship game 
And in this game, he had a long catch, like a 52-yard catch, I believe, down the field. And Stetson Bennett threw to him in the first half. So, you know, he, you know, George Pickett was available to come back and play. And so, you know, he and again, he I don't think he had a huge effect on the game, but he still was there. They had to account for him. They couldn't act like he wasn't there. And so, uh, obviously, like I said, the second half went on. Um, you, you know, Georgia's run game got better. And Stetson Bennett, you know, he made some nice plays, man, no question about it. He threw that, that, that what was that, 30-something, 40-something TD yard, 30-something, uh, 40-something yard uh, TD pass to Adonye Mitchell or Adonai Mitchell. I, can, I don't know if, I, if I'm saying his first name right. But that number five for UGA, uh, it wasn't a perfect pass. Because Adam and I had to slow up, but he jumped at the right time. And he caught the ball, and you know, you know that that that, that kind of helped Georgia get back in it. So he caught that long pass. But by golly, the most memorable play belongs to the guy you see in the center of this screen right now, and where the cursor is rotating there, Mister Keely Ringo. It, I mean, even though the uh, the game probably is gonna pretty much be over, Alabama was driving. And um, Bryce Young kind of threw the ball. And it, was, it was almost kind of like a double coverage because if you look at the play, he threw it to the left side of the field because uh, uh, Christopher Smith, who was a safety, was over in that area, and Keely Ringo was over there. It, I mean, and I, I watched that highlight probably like 50 times over the past week. It, 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 it's, it's, it's memorable, man. When, when Bryce Young tried to force that ball over there, Keely Ringo just jumped up and, and he intercepted the ball. And when he came down, you could immediately tell that Keely Ringo was looking to run because of how he, he contorted his body. He didn't look like he was gonna he was gonna go down to me because that's the first thing I said. Uh and, and, and what was ironic, if you watching in slow motion, like at certain angles, you can see that Keely, when Keely Ringo came down. Kirby Smart was almost jumping with him. I mean, that's how into it he was. <laughs> and when, when he came down with the ball, Kirby, and, and I don't know if anybody saw this, Kirby Smart was yelling at him, get down, get down, get down. And that's what I thought Keely Ringo was going to do. I thought Keely Ringo was just going to fall to the ground and just let the offense run, run, out the, run out the clock or something. And, but if you watch the game, you know that did not happen. Keely Ringo caught that ball. He kind of caught, he kind of came down. Uh, Mita just kind of cocked his body up in, in an up, upwardly square position, and he started running. Christopher Smith kind of escorted him along with some other players, I think, Dan Jackson, another safety. And they 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 threw some blocks for him down that right-hand side of the field as he ran. And Keely Ringo dodged a couple players, and then he just kind of strolled into the end zone. 79-yard INTP. It was incredible. That that that's one of the, that it's gonna be one of the greatest plays that we've ever seen in the University of Georgia history. Forty years from now, that that that's probably gonna be shown like on highlights. So Keelan Ringo gave himself a lifetime highlight, and um, it it was cool to see. I would have preferred him to see to see him do the discipline thing and go down and and just kind of trust the offense that they were just gonna run the ball out. But he didn't do that. But man, he still made it happen. <laughs> that it was really cool. I cannot lie. It was really cool to see that happen. But man, as I said, I waited a week to not only see Georgia uh you know uh close out that game, but I like to see other things that happen uh after that. Uh, if people don't know, uh yesterday on Saturday around noon, there was a national championship parade around Athens, Georgia. I did not go. But I watched it on TV in terms of certain portions of it. Uh, after the parade was over, they went to Sanford Stadium, which is the stadium that Georgia plays at. I think I think now it's called Vince Dooley Field or something like that. What they call it, Vince Dooley? It's still called Sanford Stadium. I think it's called Vince Dooley Field, which is where they play on. And if you follow Georgia football, Vince Dooley was a coach back when Herschel Walker and them were, were you know compete for national titles back when they won back in 1980. So Vince Dooley is a legendary coach. And Vince Dooley, uh, I forget, I, I don't know how old he is, but of course he's old now. He's, a, he's an elderly gentleman. He was at that game. And he was energized. And so he got a chance to watch him win. But uh, 
you know, Kirby Smart got there and said a few things, and he talked about how there was never, like, one person that really stood out on this team as, a, like, a leader, but there were a bunch of leaders. And um, he said that's one thing he treasured the most. There was a bunch of guys that would step up and make speeches throughout the season, challenge people when they need to be challenged. And that's something that I like to hear. And that's a sign of a really tight team. That That's, that's a sign of a really tight team. And, and you know, if you got multiple people who are willing to stand up and sort of take that responsibility and be like, hey, man, we're doing this together. You know, it's not going to be one dude just making all the speeches. But uh, it, it was just really cool seeing all that. And uh, um, also, uh, the one thing that I, or the main reason I really held off from doing anything was that I wanted to see uh, what some of the players were going to do in terms of making their future decisions. And again, it, this is just a week after the game. Um, and there's been a lot that's been going on, man, in terms of guys leaving. There have been maybe four or five players already to hit the transfer portal on UGA side. Guys that may have one, two years left for eligibility, uh, uh, if not more, and they've transferred away from Georgia. They got the national championship, they transferring away. <laughs> and, and they're leaving Georgia. And there have been a bunch of guys, which is what I really want to get to, who are declaring for the draft. So for those reasons, I think people just really need to take in and enjoy what they're seeing out of UGA this year. Because, man, it might be three or four more years where we can get back to the national championship. They're losing a lot of players. And you just don't really replace cats like that, you know, uh, that are leaving the program when it's so much. Like, in terms of guys who have hit the transfer portal, and let me go ahead and say the transfer portal is like the mechanism that allows players to go from one school to another. They can get in contact with people at a university. They can sort of make this stuff happen rather quickly. Uh uh, one of the players that I think was one of the first people to say he going to transfer was a defensive back. He was a reserve defensive back uh, from Florida. I think it's from like maybe Jacksonville, Florida, or something like that. I think his name was Armier Speed. I think he's been in Georgia for like four years already. I think he maybe had one year of eligibility left. And Armier was like 6'3", like 210 or something. He was a tall guy. And he played like some throughout the year, but he was never a starter. And I think he wants to see, he wants to go somewhere and see what else he can, where else he can get. And so, you know, I wish Amir the best. And uh he's one of the first players I remember hearing about in the transfer portal. Another guy, um, uh, Justin Robinson. And Justin Robinson was a disappointment for me. With Justin, he actually got some playing time early this year and in the spring. But and even and even last year, I think in the spring. He like a really a really talented guy, just physically six four, about two fifteen, two twenty, and good speed. He couldn't catch the ball because he dropped a lot of passes. Just, just in the, uh, hands were bad. He should have had more opportunities, but because he dropped so many passes so early, they couldn't depend on him. So he became like a reserve. I think uh, he announced he was transferring. Maybe a couple of days later, I got word that he was said he had settled in at Mississippi State. So good luck to Justin Robinson. You know, uh, another guy, uh, and this is, the, this is one of the guys that worries me that transferred away, is Jalen Kimber. Jalen Kimber was a cornerback. He was a highly thought-out cornerback out of Texas. Uh, last, I, think, he, I think he was a freshman last year, and this year he was supposed to be a redshirt freshman. But Jalen Kimber, he could never stay healthy. I think early in the preseason this year, he messed up his shoulder, and so he had to sit out. But, you know, he about six foot, maybe about buck 75. He was a highly thought of guy, but Jalen could never stay healthy. So that's why we never could see him. And I thought that they, that they would tend to, you know, speak highly of him. I think he was going, he was looking to start this year. You know, obviously the Keely Ringo, he was looking to start. But he, he just couldn't stay healthy. And I think he's transferring to Florida. So that's a rival of Georgia. So he's going to be going to Florida. So we probably gonna be seeing some some more with him because he's gonna be only his third year out of high school. So Jalen Kimber, like that, that's one of the more disappointing uh players that you know that that that's transferred that worried me. Cause I felt like he could have he could have really brought a lot of, of skill to that defensive backfield. Uh also, another guy, I think he's a he's a reserve receiver, Jalen Johnson. I don't know where he's headed to, but he's a reserve receiver from, from Georgia. We didn't really see too much out of him. He's 
he's transferred. He's in the transfer floor. And there might be even more guys I'm forgetting. But that, that that's that's like some of your reserves, key reserves that's transferring away. It's like four guys right there. But then came the news of who's heading to the draft. This was really was was kind of messing with me. Um, of course, Jordan Davis, I think he's a senior this year. And because of COVID, Jordan maybe could come back another year, but I don't think he is. I don't know if he's officially saying he's declaring. He might have. But I, I, I would, I'm just going to assume he's going to declare for the draft. Jordan Davis, he's a, he's a nose tackle, six foot six, three fifty man. You can't convince me that he wasn't a key player. That that, that, that guy, that guy, was, that, that guy was just a, a monster. Was Jordan Davis another defensive lineman that I know for certain he declared for the draft is Trayvon Walker. That, that he, he was a guy. He made some plays, but I think his best years are ahead of him. It's Trey Vaughn. He's about 6'5", 275. He was a defensive lineman at times, a defensive end. I think he's a good player. His best days are ahead of him. And um, and so, um, you know, he's a guy I thought who had tremendous potential. But we saw glimpses of not really consistent playmaking out of him. But he was more consistent this year. He's another defensive lineman. He's going to the draft. Um, let me see. Like, like I said, I may have to take my time. It's a lot of dudes. Um, I I don't think we've heard nothing yet out of Nolan Smith, the other defensive end. I don't think we've heard nothing out of him yet. So I don't know whether he's coming back or not. Uh, another guy, Nicobe Dean, the middle linebacker. Uh, you kind of knew Nicobe Dean was going to the pros. He's a guy that's about five eleven and a half, six feet, about two twenty, two twenty five. Now, Kobe won the Buckets Award. Just by him winning that, I'm like, what was the purpose of him coming back? And then, you know, he he's a, he won a national championship, and then his draft stock, he's probably going to be great out as a first-round player. Uh, if I was Nakobe, I would go uh, to the to the draft. And so, Nakobe being one of the linebackers who declared, he'd go into the draft. Uh, also, uh, Lewis seen, and, and I was kind of on the fence with Lewis. See, I didn't know if he was going to, uh, declare now. I think he was either first or second team All SEC. He was like a really solid player this year. He was a solid tackler, about maybe like six one one ninety five or somewhere in there. Lewis Seen was a solid player. I think there was a chance for him to come back, but he said, "No, nah, I'm gonna go ahead and take my chances right now because I just won a national championship and I was, I'm all I'm all confident." So I can't blame Lewis Seen. He I think he was a strong safety, and so, but he's a really good player. So he's. I, I I can't blame him. He's declared for the draft. He's on like a junior. Is Lewis seen? Uh, uh, Darion Kendrick. Uh, his story is kind of interesting. If you if, if you don't know, Darion Kendrick was at Clemson for like the past three to four years, <laughs> and he kind of got kicked off the team with some weird reason. I think he fell out with Dabo Sweeney in the off season. Maybe he. He had some attendance issue with some all season workout, something for personal personal reasons. So he got kicked off team. So Georgia immediately picked him up, and man, what a pickup! Minus the conference championship game, Darion Kendrick was really good this year. I think he had four picks, and he may have led the team with interceptions. And and so he was really really good this year as a solid cornerback. He showed that it was well worth him taking a chance on him coming in from a. Uh, and, and and another reason why I think that I'm glad that Darion Kendrick showed up at UGA, he knows how to win. He came from a championship program in Clemson. And for, even though it's unfortunate in terms of why he left, he knew what it took to train to be a champion. And so, you know, he came from a top five, top ten school and went to a, a top five school for certain in Georgia. So, uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, uh, with him declaring for the draft, I think he could have come back for another year because of the COVID stuff. Uh, I think even though he was maybe like a fifth-year senior, he, he was a good player for us this year. And we and it was good because we had a lot of injuries at defensive backs so that we needed him. Uh, he was a consistent guy, uh, you know, who played hard and played well. Uh, uh, defense, I'm trying to think. Man. I'm missing somebody defense. Like I said, there was a lot. Of, that's just on the defensive side of the ball. Offensively, uh, two of the starting running backs they declared for the draft. Uh, James, who I who I call Mister All Everything, 
He can run between the tackles. He can run hard. And then he, he caught the ball well out of the backfield. James Cook declared for the draft. Uh, also, Zamir Zeus White, I think he declared for the draft. And with Zamir having such an incredibly, incredible story of just persevering, not only just with football, but in life. If you read anything up on Zamir, why he had a lot of physical issues growing up. And, you know, he's had, you know, uh, issue with just surviving. I think he may have been, you know, maybe a, a child who was born a little bit prematurely to his mother. He had all kind of health problems growing up. In his senior year at uh, Scotland High School in, uh, what was that, Laurenburg, uh, North Carolina? He, 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 or that could be in South Carolina. I can't remember which state, but he blew out his knee his senior year. Going to his first year at Georgia, his true freshman season, he blew out his year in a pre, he, he blew out his other knee in preseason workout. So we didn't even get to see Zeus his first year. And so he finally got to the point where he's healthy the past couple of years. He's pretty much been their leader in Russia. Even though Zamir's had a great story, I personally been disappointed because I felt like he could have did more if he was 100% with Zamir White. And so uh, he's a guy that I might have good memories of because of his story, but you, you, he's going to be a what if. What if he had never messed up uh, both of his knees or what if he had just only messed up one knee? He probably would have even shown more. He made a few plays, but he wasn't Nick Chubb or Sony Michelle or Todd Gurley. He couldn't make them. He wasn't consistent in making long runs. He was a hard runner between the tackles. And we expected more out of him. But he still gave us, what, 700 to 800 yards each year for the past couple of years. So I can't I can't complain about Zemir. So he's declaring for the draft. Uh, I think George Pickett, the, the gentleman I mentioned earlier, he's declaring for the draft. And, you know, uh, I, 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 I'm I not sure about this. I, I don't know if Jamari Sawyer, uh, the, one of the starting tackles, he might have declared. Don't hold me to it. There's been so many guys. I, I, he may have declared. And and let me just round this off by saying with Stetson Bennett, uh, the star quarterback, we don't know what's going to go on with him. Even though he's been maligned, and us as Georgia fans have not always believed in him. And, and y'all know just, my, just by my past videos, I wasn't the biggest Stetson Bennett fan. I think because of the COVID issue, he has another year of eligibility left. So we don't know if he's going to come back or not. We'll have to see. Uh, I want, uh, and, and that's the thing with Georgia. I, I, that's why I want to emphasize why I waited a week to do this video. We losing so much up front in terms of playmakers. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be able to get back to this game. <laughs> that's a lot of talent, experience, and playmaking. And maybe, you know, Kirby Smart, fortunately, we have a coach that does an incredible job recruiting Kirby Smart and his staff. So they they have the potential to go, but I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to be less certain, you know, about it. Cause, but let me say, Keelan Ringo, the gentleman I, I mentioned earlier, he was just a red shirt freshman this year. I think Keelan messed up his shoulder last year. Uh, and, and so he could play his true freshman year in 2020. So he started this year as a, a red shirt freshman. So he has to come back for another year. Uh, Jalen Carter won the defensive line. I think that guy could be a stud. I think he's going to show up more to people now that Jordan Davis is leaving. Is Jalen Carter. He's going to show up more on stats. I think he's a really good athlete. He's a good player. He's coming back. And um, I think Chris Will Smith, he announced that he's coming back. I was kind of surprised that Chris Will Smith said that he was coming back, but he, he's coming back. He, I think he's like, what, the, the free safety? He's coming back. So I was kind of surprised by that. So there's going to be just a few guys coming back from this team that started. So we got to see what next year leads to, man. But anyway, uh, I had a lot of fun enjoying this first title in, uh, you know, UGA's uh, history of 41 years. I wasn't alive when the last one was won in 1980. and uh, But it's good to be alive to see this one happen, man. The whole state was just in the state of euphoria the entire week. And it was a beautiful thing to watch. She got J. Crew to you signed off with this video. Um, if you like the content, hit the like button. If you want to subscribe, hit the subscribe button. Go dogs!